thank you very much. I'd like to thank David O'Brien and um, everyone at Limerick Civic Trust for inviting me uh, to be part of this lecture series and to speak in this absolutely stunning location. Uh, I know St Mary's Cathedral well, having grown up in Limerick in Raheen. And I'm delighted to have my parents here tonight, Des and Burl Carswell, and also my brother Des. Um, sometimes when I give a speech, I feel a little like uh, Joan Collins' fifth husband on his wedding night. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't know how to make it interesting. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should take the advice of one of my editors at the Irish Times, who prefers reporters to keep their stories short when they're writing for our website. I suppose there's merit in brevity. Um, just look at Ernest Hemingway's flash fiction work of genius. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. Six words. Then there's Pythagoras' theorem. <clears throat> just 24 words. Our Lord's Prayer, 66 words. Uh, the Ten Commandments, 179 words. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, 286 words. The US Constitution with all 27 amendments, 7,818 words. Our own constitution, 17,852 words. Then there's the European Union's 2012 Directive on the Efficient Use of Energy, 28,948 words. Many, many words have been written about how Donald Trump's election and the Brexit vote happened, written to try and help people understand the powerful forces of populism that swayed two of the world's most advanced electorates over the course of 2016. There will be many, many more words written over the coming years about these subjects. I'm going to offer some words of my own this evening on the topic of economic recovery, Trump, Brexit, and the risk of leaving people behind. I hope to look at this through the prism of my experiences on the road in the United States, covering last year's presidential election as Washington correspondent for the Irish Times. I hope to explain why I think Trump got elected, and I'll also offer some parallels that can be drawn in the UK from Brexit that I witnessed firsthand when I covered the British general election this summer. I also want to take you back to November 2015, a full year before the US presidential election to the middle of America. I was sitting in a coffee shop in downtown Des Moines, the state capital of Iowa. This is the Midwestern state where people vote for the first time in those famous Iowa caucuses on the candidates they think should represent their parties in the US presidential election. It was almost three months before the Iowa vote was to take place and I traveled there to follow Jeb Bush. He's the former Florida governor and the brother of George W. Bush. And I was there to follow him around for a few days. I wanted to see why the man who was thought to be the Republican favorite initially was struggling against Donald Trump, the property mogul turned reality TV star whose unlikely candidacy shot him to the top of the polls. After watching Bush mingle with voters in a suburban supermarket, making small talk with customers as he poured coffee at a military veterans breakfast, I could see why. He was so wooden and scripted and extremely awkward with the people whose votes he was banking on. He was, as Trump accurately described, low energy. He was far from natural. I spent a few hours talking to voters, asking questions of the political hangers-on around Bush, and then drove to a coffee shop in the middle of Des Moines to write and file my article. After a few hours, I noticed the skies darkening above me, and I decided to check the online weather reports on my laptop. I saw that a storm was heading towards Des Moines. I decided to make a dash for the airport in the hope that I would get there before the heavens opened and hoping that my flight would not be delayed. As I was driving to the airport in another suburb, the wind started to whip up. At one point, I looked up and noticed what looked like hundreds of starlings flying in the sky next to my car. I had seen what are called murmurations of starlings before, including above the aerials over the regional hospital near my home in Raheen here in Limerick. And in Iowa that day, I thought those were starlings or birds twisting in flight, creating dark, changing shadows in the sky. But they weren't. These Iowa starlings were in fact leaves flying in a circular motion up in the sky. It was a tornado. I'd never seen one before. The force of it was remarkable. It had come out of nowhere. I saw what I thought was a flash of light not far from my car. It was in fact the wind ripping a branch from a tree, exposing a large white gash of timber on the trunk of the tree. I turned left quick and I made it to the airport intact and counted my blessings when I got there. That tornado was an omen of things to come in the presidential election campaign over the following year. Trump surprised everyone, announcing his candidacy out of the blue and then leading a hostile takeover of the Republican Party and eventually winning the White House, taking out two political dynasties on his way, the Bushes and the Clintons. He won by carrying the, American, the states of America's tornado alley, from Texas to Alabama in the south, right up to the Rust Belt, from Pennsylvania in the east to Michigan, and on to Wisconsin in the Midwest. 
It was a stunning and shocking win that few predicted. So what was this kinetic energy that powered the political whirlwind that was Donald Trump? It was change, or more specifically, the promise of change. Trump effectively presented himself as the agent of change in the election. And where did he tap this energy from? From the people who felt left behind. People who feel left behind can be a very powerful force, particularly if you can harness their anger. That is exactly what Donald Trump did. I don't think Trump is an intelligent man, but he is not stupid. He diagnosed the illness correctly. The majority of Americans were unhappy with the direction that the country was heading in. And he offered simple remedies. Build that wall, drain the swamp, bomb the shit out of ISIS, America first, bring back jobs. Those were things that an angry electorate could relate to, distilling his message down to a simple bumper sticker slogan, make America great again. Whether those simple fixes would actually work, and I wager that they will not, did not seem to matter. That slogan of Trump's, while unoriginal, it was Ronald Reagan's before it was his, was simple. It tripped off the tongue. It was visceral. It stirred the emotion rather than the intellect. And this was an election of the gut, not the mind. The slogan was effective on several levels. It appealed to people who had different ideas of what great again meant, to people who wanted America to be the economic force or undisputed global superpower it once was. It appealed to people who wanted America to be a whiter, more conservative place again, not this multicultural, racially mixed country with rapidly changing social norms. In contrast, there was Hillary Clinton and her heavily poll-tested, focus-grouped campaign. Everything was measured in advance and well-measured at that. Nothing was left to chance. At times, it felt like it was cooked up in a political lab, not with the concerns of everyday Americans in mind or listening to the anger of the people. Just look at her slogan, Stronger Together. It was one of 85 possibilities considered by our campaign team before they plumped for that one. It did nothing to address the main concerns of voters and was more of a statement about what she was not than what she was for. The implicit meaning of her slogan was that she was not divisive like Trump, but her slogan was not nearly as effective as his. Clinton was up against one of America's great salesmen in Trump. He is a marketing genius. He knew from the outset who his market was and he continued to play to it for the duration of his 17 month campaign. His message, message was basic and he remained on message for the entire campaign. This was a man who lived in gold gilded penthouses in gaudy mansions, in buildings named after him, flying around in planes and helicopters named after him, mixing with rich Manhattan elites from the world of property, celebrity and finance. And yet he managed to sell himself as the champion of the working class, as the blue collar billionaire, as his campaign put it. The American author Fran Lebowitz summed it up perfectly. He was a poor person's idea of a rich person. The Trump's vote, Trump voters thinking was, if he did it for himself, if he became that rich, maybe he could do that for me and for the country. I appreciate that this is very difficult to do, but I think you need to leave aside the fires of controversy that blazed around Trump during the campaign. His insulting of women, an American war hero, a disabled reporter, his incitement to violence at his rallies, his bragging about being able to sexually assault a woman because he was a celebrity. It is difficult to leave them aside as they are shocking, but Trump's theme was consistent and effective beyond that. He promised he would take care of the working class people. He was not the typical Republican who was going to focus on cutting taxes for the wealthy. But in the eyes of the working class, he was the voice of reason about jobs and economic growth. In a way, he took Bill Clinton's It's the Economy Stupid campaign message that was so popular with working class white voters in the so-called flyover states in the 1990s. And he used it with great effect against Clinton's wife in the, in the 2016 campaign. He's not Hillary Clinton and, he, and he's for jobs was how one wealthy New Yorker explained to me why he was voting for a businessman, for the businessman when I asked at a rally in upstate New York. It was that simple. Hillary Clinton in her recent memoir, What Happened, says that she misjudged the mood of the electorate. She did not fully realize what the American people wanted. She wrote in her book, and I quote, when people are angry and looking for someone to blame, they don't want to hear your 10 point plan to create jobs and raise wages. They want you to be angry too. I read an interview with one of her campaign aides in an Irish newspaper a couple of weeks ago. He said voters were looking for anger more than they were looking for answers, and Donald Trump gave that to them. I thought Clinton's book contained a breathtakingly naive statement for a second time presidential candidate. She said, and I quote again, the piece that I perhaps undervalued is that from this perspective, the details of the plan may matter less than how it's framed and sold to the public. I thought perhaps, that she thought there was some uncertainty in that statement. This statement alone shows how poor a politician Clinton was. 
She was the wrong candidate for the, at the wrong time for the Democratic Party. To me, it captures the arrogance about around Clinton's campaign, the sense of entitlement that this was her time and she did not need to sell her message, just to point to her experience and why she was the best person for the job. She ran a cynic, cynical campaign too, targeting specific groups of voters rather than the entire electorate. She targeted moderates in America's cities and suburbs, driven by a too great a reliance by her campaign team on, da on data. She ignored rural parts of the country and large swathes of the population. She didn't even travel to Wisconsin, a state that had voted for Democratic nominees since the 1980s. This was a state that she needed to hold in the so-called blue Democratic wall, and she didn't. She took that state and so much more for granted. The Obama coalition that swept into power twice was fractured last year. There are 3,088 counties in America. 206 of them voted for Obama twice and then switched to Trump. Most of them were in the Midwest. Clinton focused on too narrow a constituency in the election. As Obama said in his post-mortem press conference a few days after the election last year, you have to campaign everywhere. You have to go everywhere. I think there are parallels here with the Remain campaign and the Brexit referendum. There was too great a concentration by the then British Prime Minister David Cameron and the rest of the Remain campaign on warning voters that a vote to leave the European Union was too economically risky. Voters react negatively to negative campaigns and don't like pa politicians patronisingly telling them what they shouldn't do. They need to be sold on the positives, the positives of remaining within the EU, not the negatives. I think to dismiss your defeat in an election solely on an angry electorate is to fail to carry out an honest analysis of what Hillary Clinton missed in her campaign. The anger of working class America has been building, had been building for more than two decades. Wages had stagnated. Average family incomes had not risen in 15 years. The gap between rich and poor grew, grew wider with the rich taking almost all of the gains since the economic crash. In economic terms, the country's industrial and manufacturing sector had been hollowed out. The rust belt had become rustier than ever. Blue collar jobs had been shipped overseas. International competition had eroded the sector. Products were being made cheaper and better overseas. The Obama-Clinton Democratic wing of the party in effect said that these, were ch these, that these changes were an economic fact of life, a consequence of a globalized world that could not be reversed. In other words, their message to the American public in these areas was deal with it. Clinton even suggests in her book that people in the Rust Belt should accept a reality, that they may have to leave their hometowns to find work. This may be true in part, but politically this is suicide for a candidate. And it is even more dangerous if the candidate refused to go to these parts and to campaign with, with two voters. I would go further and say that Trump's election and Brexit on this side of the Atlantic were the first electoral revolts in response to the financial crisis and the war in Iraq and subsequent chaos in the Middle East. Michael Cox, the professor of international relations at the London School of Economics, has described well the populism playing out in the US and Europe. He's called it an expression of a sense of powerlessness, ordinary citizens feeling powerless when faced with great changes going on around them, and the powerlessness of established politicians and political parties to respond to those changes adequately. Cox told the Royal Irish Academy in a recent lecture that the financial crisis undermined faith in the competence and morality of the economic establishment, from bankers to regulators to central bankers to governments. The Iraq war and the unrest in the Middle East questioned the capacity of Western countries to competently deal with or have a strategy to cope with an increasingly violent region. If you look at Trump or Brexit, there was a common theme. You cannot trust the establishment and we know better than the experts. Trust us, is what they said. In Trump's case, he spoke with a straight face of how he got his military advice from the Sunday political talk shows and that with regard to America's problems, he told the Republican convention, I alone can fix it. Or in Britain, there was Michael Gove for the Leave campaign saying that people in this country have had enough of experts. Admissions that you can trust your own views over those of the experts in a particular field was a proud and indeed a reasonable boast in the political climate of 2016. In Britain, when I travelled from the constituency of Murray in the north of Scotland to Yorkshire and on down to the West Midlands earlier this summer, I came across much of the same anger against the establishment as I witnessed on the US presidential election campaign. The thing people were most fed up about was being asked to cast a vote again. Outside of London, the Brexiteers were angry at immigration and the number of foreigners in their country, just like Trump did when he played to his electorate in America. The Brexit campaign, like Trump, fanned anger about outsiders from an economic point of view, claims that they were taking jobs, 
From a national security point of view, they claim that loose immigra immigration policies would lead to acts of terror. In an American context, I think the origins of this erosion of trust in the establishment, particularly when it comes to economic matters, goes back much, much further than the financial crisis of 2008. People started feeling left behind many years before Trump. One of the reasons why international trade became such a hot topic of anger dates back to the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which was introduced in the mid-90s. This is the free trade agreement that Trump has blamed, on, has blamed for, for, for the loss of so many American jobs and that he wants to renegotiate. During the campaign, I spoke to one Democratic strategist from, the, from Appalachia, the Rust Belt, who had great insights in all of this. He knew well the area of the country that sealed Trump's victory. He has a great name. His name was Dave Mudcat Saunders. He had long thought, he thought long and hard about the problems facing the Democratic Party establishment. He called that wing of the party the Metropolitan Opera Wing and said they had lost touch with blue collar Democrats. He'd worked on campaigns in Virginia and across Appalachia and saw firsthand the frustration of workers who were told that all they needed to do was upskill, to learn more, to be able to do more. And if they did that, they would survive. But they did this, and still the jobs did not come, or certainly not in the same number to replace the number of jobs lost. So broken promises and workers being patronizingly told that their skills are out of date and just needed updating fueled much anger. Retraining for what, Saunders asked, echoing the views of many of these voters who, who went for Trump in the election. In the end, Hillary Clinton could not shake the perception, despite flipping her views on issues that affected these kinds of voters, that she was a free trader and a candidate of the status quo. All this set the stage for the 2016 election and all it needed was the right performer. Along came Trump, the P.T. Barnum of American politics, the snake oil salesman promising a miracle tonic. He was a very effective performer taking advantage of all those many Americans who felt left behind. He used all those years of exploiting the New York tabloid media on the Manhattan celebrity circuit and playing the pantomime villain on his TV show The Apprentice. He expertly manipulated the news agenda on American TV. For example, when the Access Hollywood tape came out and those horrendous comments about women, Trump distracted voters by capitalizing on the leaking of Clinton's campaign emails. With help from the Russians and FBI director James Comey, Trump had plenty of material to distract with. And Trump showed the power, the power of these weapons of mass distraction. His rise coincided with the decline in the traditional media. That is no coincidence. And the rise of social media. Technology advances in the ability of people to pick and choose their own news and facts and to have them confirmed with more of the same news and facts by algorithms used by the likes of Facebook helped Trump win over voters in these self-curated social media cocoons. He was able to bypass checks and balances that the media would traditionally perform on candidates and he could manipulate voters directly. In these echo chambers, Trump and his supporters could easily dismiss facts that they didn't like as fake news. To go back to my friend Mudcat Saunders, he described political economic populism as being a very loud language, that it required a loud voice. Trump had that in spades. For what it's worth, Saunders also put Trump in an historical context. He fit the same mold that produced Andrew Jackson 200 years ago and Teddy Roosevelt 100 years ago. It was a 100 year thing, he said. Both tackled political and economic elites and came to power with a promise to restore economic fairness. The question of whether Trump will deliver on his stratospheric promises remains to be seen, and I would hazard a guess that if people were angry when they elected him, they will be even angrier by the time 2020 comes around if he seeks re-election. His promises will have fallen well short. Where my years reporting in the US were dominated by going out into the heart of America, away from the liberal coastal elites and outside the Beltway in Washington, my seven months reporting since I returned to Ireland have focused on looking at people left behind here. They've included business people along the border counties who feel they have been ignored by the Dublin government and are fearful about what might come with Brexit and a hard border. They've included people living in and around ghost estates in locations that will not be lifted by an economic uh, recovery or a property market recovery. They've included desperate people searching for homes who've been priced out of rental properties and buying in a dysfunctional market that is stressed because the financial crisis wiped out the construction industry and governments got out, successive governments got out of the business of building public housing decades ago. They've also included cons commuters who spend many, many hours away from their loved ones because they cannot afford to live closer to where they work and because the government's economic development plan has been lopsided and wrongly skewed towards Dublin for many, many years. 
Having left Ireland and reported at the worst point in the financial crisis before the move to the US, I've been shocked to find on my return many of the problems that were there when I left have gone unresolved. From the crippling mortgage debt and desperate cases of insolvency, to unaffordable homes and a return to the pressure to increase wages to meet the high cost of living and the potential for another economic bubble. Our economic recovery has been far from even and that carries huge risks to established political order and reasonable political debate. We have seen the effect of leaving people behind in the US and the UK and the consequences that flow from that, the election of Trump and the vote for Brexit. Where people feel they are not represented, where they feel disenfranchised, things fall apart. The centre does not hold, as Yates wrote. While headline figures show a stunning economic recovery here, economic growth soaring, unemployment falling, we need to track the country's successes along different measures to gauge a more balanced recovery, a recovery for the country as a whole and not just for an economy. There needs to be, for example, accurate numbers on the number of new homes being built and that need to be built. The housing agency says 81,000 by 2020, but many ex experts think this falls well short, given the catch-up that needs to be done. Put simply, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Other measures, not just GDP, GDP growth, need to be monitored closely to gauge successes and failures. The number of people living in homeless for, homelessness, for example, 8,160. The number of children living in homelessness, almost 3,000. The number of people on public housing waiting lists, 91,000. The number of people in mortgage arrears, one in 10. The number in long-term mortgage arrears who it would seem will never have any hope of paying for the properties they live in. 33,000 people are two years or more behind on their mortgages. There should be gauges to measure the quality of people's lives, around the amount of time that people spend traveling to work and how far they have to live away from home to find affordable accommodation, the number of children in ch childcare and the time parents spend away from their families. This will, will be the gap between where the haves and the have-nots are in Ireland, quality of life issues. These are the key socioeconomic gaps that must be filled. These should be the guides to know whether you are leaving people behind. Emigration has provided an escape valve for successive Irish governments dealing with more than a decade of crisis. It has let so many politicians off the hook, but I think it's not unreasonable for people to expect bold actions from the political establishment to deal with the busy, biggest risk facing the country now. Put simply, finding people places to live. If this truly is a republic of opportunity, it should be a republic for all people and not just those who get up early in the morning. Our new teacher should have known better than to use that kind of divisive rhetoric in light of the us versus them punch and Judy politics that proved so corrosive in the US and the UK last year. So for what it's worth, those are my views on Trump, Brexit and the risk of leaving people behind. At just over 4,000 words, it's not short, but I hope you find it of some value. Thank you for your time.